Hey guys, Adam Savage here in my cave. One of my great hobbies that might not be obvious on this channel is that I love peeling the curtain back on the world. I love doing a corporate gig in Vegas because I get to walk through all the back hallways of all those casinos. And I just, I love me some infrastructure and I love to be able to, like I said, peel the curtain back on the world. Uh, and that is germane to this video because our friends at Lumafield, a local company that has a portable CT scanner for industry, have asked me if I have any objects in my collection, I would like them to scan in their CT scanner. And I did. Uh, specifically, these two radio tube type things. This is a Philips photo multiplier. And I hate to tell you that if you gave it to me, I am sorry, I can't remember that you gave it to me. It sits on my NASA shelf, so I think it has something to do with space. And then this was gifted to me very recently. It is called a Thiatron. No, it's not an exercise thing for, for leg day. Uh, no, this is a switch for gigantic amounts of electricity. Uh, we are gonna put these in Lumafield CT scanner, and then they tell me in their software, we'll be able to fly through and look at every aspect of how these two things are built. Let's head over to their shop. Hey, Scott. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, so you have scanned these two tubes, is that right? That's right, yeah. Um, yeah, this one's pretty, they're both really interesting, actually. I'm really uh, excited to take a look at these. I think this has something to do with NASA. It was on my NASA shelf and I had a note with it and somehow I lost the note, but it is some kind of um, photo multiplier tube. Am I correct about that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, this is a photo multiplier tube uh, made by Philips in France. Um, it's, uh, it's it's really, really interesting. Um, this is a, a device that you would use to detect, um, to, de to turn light into an electrical current that you can measure. Um, it, it, uh, it's sort of a predecessor to the image sensors that we know uh, today from, from cameras. Um, but uh, some of these photomultipliers uh, have such gain that you can actually detect individual photons, which is really wow. interesting. So, so here's the scan, uh, and actually I like to start by looking at the radiograph. So, so we, we scan this in our Neptune CT scanner, mm -hmm. and the, the way this works, we're taking a whole bunch of X-ray images of this thing as we spin it around. So uh, unlike a medical CT scanner where the machine is spinning around the, the patient, we're taking a, a bunch of pictures with the machine staying stationary and the part rotating. Copy that. Um, and uh, you can see as I scrub through here, you can see all the different images that we've taken. And, and this is uh, you know, enough information here that as you move around, you can really start to see how this works. But what's pretty special is once we, can, once we feed these through our algorithm and reconstruct them, we can turn it into uh, something three-dimensional. So what easier. just happened between those two images? You called the first one a radiograph. That's right. Yeah, yeah. the radiograph is a simple x-ray image. Uh, so that's the first raw data yeah, path. It's simply the shadow cast by these materials when you pass x rays through it. And so the darker materials uh, are showing areas of higher density. So mm -hmm. you can see here, you know, the, the glass envelope of this tube is fairly low density. Down here you have some heavier metals and at the back you have this very uh, big, very big, coil. Yeah, big yeah. spring, uh, probably steel. Um, and you can also clearly see the, uh, the electrical wires that come out here. And, and a funny thing happens, you can actually can see the electrical crimps very well, but not so much the connector housing. <laughs> Okay, so what happens between the radiograph and that beautiful color image we were just looking yeah, at? Yeah, so we run this through an algorithm that's essentially looking at this set of images. There might be hundreds or sometimes thousands of these images, and it's saying, you know, what is the three-dimensional object that could have been represented by these, these sets of shadows? And, uh, and that's our reconstruction algorithm. So, so did, that it is assigns each of those things different densities and gives it colors based and, on that? And puts it into 3D. So the, okay. color, the colors are artificial here. The colors right. are just a, you know, we can choose different color maps to help exaggerate those density differences. Uh, we could also view this in black and white, but the colors really help it pop. But this, this, the, the, the glass envelope for this just really looks incredibly beautiful. It is, it is. And actually, you know, something I really like to do, uh, because we can visualize density here, and again, this is, this is in uh, three dimensions, uh, so you can can sort of, you know, now we can sort of, you know, move around and, and explore this uh, as if it were a video wow. game. But, you know, we also have the ability to mask away different densities. So over here I have a histogram, which, you know, works like the histogram in your camera, but I can move these sliders and either show or hide uh, areas. Ooh. So I can take away that glass tube because it's lower density. And now we're looking at just those, those high density components. So when you can actually scrub out different densities That's so you right. can look more clearly. Yeah, so here I can adjust the histogram view uh, to kind of block away the, the areas of lower oh, density, like the glass. Wow. And now you can really see those heavier metals here. Um, 
from the, uh, you know, the cathode and uh, these electrodes down here and uh, all the way down to the, uh, the anode here. And, the, and of course the spring, which is a, a very dense uh, metal, probably steel. Right, right. I can see it through. Okay, so I love seeing a little crimps here at the end of the, uh, of the uh, connector. Yeah, yeah, pretty wild. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay, so can you, is it possible to explain how this works by looking at its structure here? Yeah, let's take a look. Actually, I, I've cropped a view here that I think helps better explain what's going on. Now, Ooh. if you look at the real tube, um, you can't really see all of this uh, just, from, just from sight, but uh, you can sort of see the, the beginnings of, of these, these curved pieces of metal here. And, and that's this kind of yeah. strange pathway. Yeah, and you start to realize there's a, there's a lot going on here. This is a very uh, uh, artisanally crafted uh, yeah. device. And what's really cool, what's happening here, um, you know, photons come in through this window at the end here and they strike, uh, they strike a cathode. And what happens here, when they hit that cathode, the photon gets changed into an electron. Mm -hmm. And that electron gets steered by some electrodes into this first curved paddle here. And that, that, that paddle is called a dynode. This one? Yeah, that's okay. right. And there's a whole sequence of these things. And, uh, and this is where the magic happens. And this is why we call it a photomultiplier. So that first electrode that, that came from a, or the first electron that came from a, a photon yeah. hits that dynode and uh, it gets re-emitted as more electrons. It gets oh, multiplied. Wow. So you know, it might be multiplied by a factor of 10. So now you have 10 electrons coming off that. And they kind of, because of the electric fields that are present inside this tube, they kind of get steered away toward the second diode. They hit that surface and multiply, and multiply again. it again. And so it happens over and over and over again. So you might have, you know, wow. you know, uh, you know, 10, uh, you know, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, yeah, you know, each one adds a zero. Kind of, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you get a lot of amplification here. And then you know, those electrons wind up hitting the anode at the back here. And that's where the signal comes out. And that's a, that's a current uh, or a pulse of current that represents the light that came in. You know, it's funny because <clears throat> on one hand, we look at something like this and we think that it has an analog in some solid state, tiny things in our machines. And thus, the large scale old version might seem primitive in some ways, and yet there's a surpassing amount of really, really incredible precise engineering going on in this. It's far from primitive. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, the exact shape and curvature of these, uh, of these dynodes and their alignment with respect to each other. Um, you know, not only did somebody have to design that and construct it, but then they had to do the ship in a bottle of getting it into this tube, uh, right. which is, you know, perfectly clean and perfectly oh, made. Go. It's just, I mean, I, there's something so beautiful about the ways in which we learn to solve problems. And I mean, I'm sure that this was necessary for us to have the one that we have, right? right. Like, again, we, we think of old technology as like, well, they don't do that anymore for a reason. And it's yeah. like, no, 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 it was an in integral step to where we got to today. That's right. And uh, photomultipliers are not completely obsolete yet. You know, okay. these are still manufactured in some volume for some very niche applications. And, uh, you know, they can, res they can accept photons that are outside of the wavelengths that we can uh, sense with conventional you know, semiconductor sensors. So uh, there are still some, uh, some applications where these make a lot of sense. Wow. And you said that this can be potentially as sensitive enough to read a single photon. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. So for scientific instruments where you need to, you know, get every last photon to get your answer, this, this might be your only ticket. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay, let's go for the big one now. You oh, also right. scanned this, yes. this thing, the yes. Thyrotron. The Thyrotron, yes. This now, is a hydrogen Thyrotron. A friend of mine recently brought this by because he said, quote, I know you like this stuff. <laughs> Uh, but then he described its function, and it's an incredible piece of equipment. It is, yeah. It, this is an electrical switch, almost like a relay, yes? That's right, yeah. When I saw it, I thought, oh my god, this is a huge vacuum tube. But in fact, it's not even a truly a vacuum tube. There's, oh, there's no not. vacuum inside. Oh. Uh, it's full of hydrogen gas. That's part of what makes this special and, and different from a conventional vacuum tube. But it's also, uh, this is a very high voltage, high current device as well. This is a, a, a 25,000 volt, uh, I think about a thousand amp switch. 25,000 volt, 1,000 amp. Isn't that wild? You can see this heavy silicone wire here to deal with that, uh, the high voltage. I think we generated lightning bolts on the show that weren't that powerful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This uh, is, so what would this be necessary for? You know, for moving is, huge amounts of current somewhere. Yeah, if you were building a power supply for something like a pulsed gas laser or a linear accelerator, and you need to have you know, very precise control of, of these kinds of voltages and currents, yeah. um, this is, uh, this is something you would use. Um, it's, uh, again, it's, a, it's an electrical switch, not unlike a transistor in the solid state form. Um, 
it's similar to a vacuum tube in that you have an anode and a cathode and right. a grid that allows you to control a larger current with a smaller current. But right. unlike a vacuum tube, once you turn it on, you can't turn it off again. Oh. So you're kind, of, you're kind of kicking it on and it stays on. And what's happening is that because the tube is full of hydrogen, um, instead of just having electrons flowing through a vacuum, you're actually igniting a plasma, kind of like a neon lamp. And uh, once you've kicked it on, there's a, you know, a tremendous amount of, of conductivity here and that current just starts flowing. So it's self-latching it's self to a certain extent. That's right. You, you can't unlatch it. That's right. Un just like uh, in a solid state form, an SCR is, is a, sort of a modern replacement for this. Now, they never made SCRs at this kind of voltage and current. What's an SCR? Uh, silicon controlled rectifier. Okay. You were saying earlier, and this was totally fascinating to me, that this thing can generate its own hydrogen. That's right. Um, yeah, so what I believe is going on here at the bottom, so I'll, I'll explain kind of the theory of operation for the yeah. rest of the tube, but down at the bottom, uh, there's these little metal tubes with, uh, with electrical connections at either mm -hmm. end. And I believe those are full of titanium hydride powder, which is a, a material that when you heat it will actually give off a pure form of hydrogen gas. And the reason for that is that, you know, this tube needs to have a certain amount of hydrogen inside in order mm -hmm. to function. But hydrogen is very small and it will leak out of every tiny, every tiny seal uh, in this device and over time. So if you want it to last a long time, it needs to be able to resupply its own hydrogen. Oh my God, my mind is totally blown because I've always known this about helium, right? You can't yeah. draw a perfect vacuum on Earth because helium and will find their way through the That's metal because right. right. they're so small. And of course, hydrogen being lower on the periodic yeah. table, of course they would do the same thing. But yeah. somehow I've never, it's never occurred to me that hydrogen would also leak in yeah, or out. It's an even anywhere. harder problem. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, so that little tube heats up, generates enough hydrogen. Now, what does the hydrogen do for the electrical current? Yeah. So the hydrogen gas is there uh, to help uh, create a plasma when this thing gets going. So you have an anode at the top here uh, with this, with this uh, silicone lead. It comes mm -hmm. through a seal in here and comes to a plate. Um, there's a bunch of little baffles and things like that in here, but basically there's, a, there's an anode, a control grid, and a cathode, but the cathode uh, is kind of hidden inside of the shield. And so, you know, when we first saw this thing, I was like, oh, you know, what are you really going to see in the scan, right? But it, it, clearly this thing is, uh, is completely, you know, completely clear. You should be able to see everything, but it turns out these, these structures are necessary to, to make this thing work and you can't see through them. So here we are on the CT scan and now you can see what's really going on inside this tube. Um, so here you can see the, the, the glass seal, the feed through mm -hmm. for yeah. this anode and where it connects to this plate. There's a bunch of discs here which are really to shield that grid electrode. And that, that grid is what the control element for this device. That's stopping that plasma from starting until you really want it to go. <laughs> until um, you've said yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, and then uh, down here, you know, I'll show, I'll switch this is, to This a, is the DNA of the device, right? That's right. Yes, that, that double helix is, uh, <laughs> is a award-winning uh, creation here. So here's a view that I like. Oh, it's uh, like a so slice through. Yeah, so we've, this is still in 3D, but we've kind of cropped through the middle of this thing virtually. And this is one of the things I love so about CT cool. scanning. Uh, you can just sort of slice and dice as if you had a bandsaw anywhere <gasps> you want. Oh and, my uh, gosh. You know, so... You so, can choose anywhere in this scan to slice through and take exactly, a look. Exactly, exactly. And I, yeah, I, I love doing this kind of thing. Um, so here you can see that, that double helix that you were talking about mm -hmm. here, that wire that runs through here. That is a cathode heater, actually. The cathode is this tubular structure that's inside of this, and it's sitting inside of another tubular structure, the one we can see here, <laughs> which is really just a shield, and it, it's, you know, it's connected to ground. It's, you know, it's just there to, uh, to keep things from, to keep the fields where they need to be. It's astounding to me that all these structures can receive 20. 5,000 volts at 1,000 amps and not just turn into a lump of carbon. It is crazy, yeah. And I, I can only imagine how warm this thing must get when it's on. Uh, you can see that they have a lot of parallel connections to bring that current down through the bottom here as well. So, um, Oh, a, right, so these connections are all part of what actually is the output is. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, yeah, crazy engineering, and uh, it must be uh, pretty spectacular to see one of these things turn on. And there's not a factory that blows these glass enclosures. This is hand done, right? That's right, yeah. This is one of the things I love. Uh, you know, vacuum tubes, uh, yeah, eventually people, you know, were able to mass produce things like that. But uh, an object like this, this would have been, you know, hand, hand done uh, with, by a scientific glass blower. And uh, I love the kind of craftsmanship that goes into making an object like this. It really does feel hand hewn. I mean, yeah. there's just a way of, about it that it's, it's clear that it's not like machines just built it and delivered it to you. That's right, yeah. And that's incredible to me. I, yeah. You know, this, it, radio tubes are often like 
our cultural marker for the deep past, but these are still being used in machines today, right? That's right. Yeah, some very you know very high end instruments like a you know imagine a, a pulsed gas laser or something like that. You might need something like this to control it. That needs a very fast amount of huge current. That's right. Incredible. Yeah. Look, I mean, my whole business uh, as a science communicator has always been about pulling aside the curtain of the world yeah. and looking at how things work from the inside. This is such a, I'm like kind of wrapping my head around all the things I want to look into. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a particular favorite uh, over the years that you have put in the scanner and gotten a really unexpected view on something you didn't? <sighs> Gosh, you know, I, I, you know, I, even even simple objects like shoes, uh, you know, you really? put a sneaker in a scanner, and uh, you wouldn't think you'd see anything interesting. But it's actually, you know, it's it's something. It's so ubiquitous. You would think there's no engineering and no art to how yeah. it's made, but actually, it's multiple materials, multiple processes. It's very, it's handmade and yet machine made at the same time. Yeah. Um, and oftentimes, you know, you can look inside of a shoe and see things uh, like uh, you know tooling marks and uh, you know serial numbers and things like that that you weren't expecting to see. Oh, wow. um, and uh, yeah, I, I love. I love being able to see that stuff. That is really thrilling. Yeah. I just, I also love this ghostly image, the, yeah. the way the glass shows up. It's yeah, so, yeah. It's like there's that aspect of reality being better than the way a special effects technician would think reality yeah. might look. Right. <laughs> the, right. The real thing is even cooler. Yeah, absolutely. You imagine trying to build this uh, this metallic structure up here. Uh, I don't know if those are stamped or, or you know, little pieces of thin metal. Or... Well, I mean, and all this begins as a theory where someone says, maybe I can build a switch that can handle that. All right, what are the components it's going to need? How right. are these electrons going to move? They're going to move. It's all this math that generates yeah. this. And then right. someone builds and it doesn't quite work, but they're kind of close. Yeah. It's, it's a thrilling development process when I, when I think it all the way through. And it is, this is our, like our modern world was built with these things. Right. We just yeah. don't need as many of them as we used to. Yeah. Speaking of the modern world, uh, would you like to take a look at a, a modern device that's kind of similar in function to that this? That does icon? a similar thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So this, <laughs> this here, <laughs> no is, is a, a power device. This is a you know a module that has a pair of IGBTs. Those are insulated gate bipolar transistors and okay. and some diodes on it as well. This is something that you would see inside of you know maybe uh, an inverter uh, an inverter drive on a on a machine you know mm -hmm. a milling mm -hmm. machine or something like that um, or a boost converter on a solar inverter. This is sort of a you know a modern modern power element and um, you can and see this does a similar thing. It it does in some ways. It contains some switch elements that mm -hmm. can control very high voltages and currents. Now the ratings are not identical to right, the thiotron right. here. This isn't a twenty five thousand volt device or anything. Thing like that, but uh, it, you know, if you did see one, it would you know perhaps be packaged in a very similar way. Wow! And uh, you can see the miniaturization that's happened here. And one of the things so we, we we put this in our CT scanner as well. And uh, oh. you know, one of my immediate conclusions from looking at this thing is like, wow, it's actually way less interesting to look at because <laughs> it's been engineered to such a degree uh, that it's basically a, a planar device uh, that's entirely optimized for heat extraction. Um, you know, you can see oh. this this row of pins here is where the circuit board fits over the top sure. of this device, and and this is where you actually control it. But you know, the the transistors, the IGBTs, and the diodes, they're, they're putting all of their heat directly to this uh, this copper heat sink on the bottom. And that, that you that's what that a, the honeycomb is is it actually a heat dissipator. That's right, and you you'd mount this with thermal paste directly to a big oh, aluminum plate. Of course you would. Plate, right, right, you know? right. So, and this is just electricity comes through some of these posts and moves through this machine and gets switched to. Is there like like a, a control side and yeah, a yeah, well, so, side? Yeah, so you know, the way we're looking at it right here, the, um, the switches are all at the bottom here, but this is, uh, this is essentially all these devices are, are sitting in a plane right here. Mm -hmm. And uh, everything, every, you know, we're, we're not looking at the, the packaging currently. Yeah. Uh, we can kind of include a little bit of that oh, uh, wow. by scrubbing in here. But, uh, you know, really you're just seeing some leads that are fixed onto here. And it's actually, you know, it's a little bit boring kind of to look at. But, yeah. uh, but this is, you know, this is how things are done today. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, progress. Dude, I, it's so lovely to be able to glimpse inside. This is science fiction, right? Yeah. This is exactly like, we were looking at movies of people spinning the insides of objects 20, 30 years ago, and here it actually is. That's awesome. Yeah. Dude, thank you so much for this. I really Pleasure. appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. My favorite part about that was finding out that this is not a vacuum tube, that it is actually filled with hydrogen, and because hydrogen molecules are so tiny they can get through even glass, it has its own source of hydrogen. This, I don't know why, but that made me really, really excited. If you would like to do a fly-through of Lumafield's CT scan of the Thiatron, well, click on a link in the description and have at it.